Pre-launch activities are in full swing at Starbase as SpaceX plans to conduct the Starship's first orbital flight test this month. Let us continue from where I left off in the last update. Starship Orbital Launch Mount is receiving final upgrades ahead of the historic test flight. Shields continue to be added to the launch mount and teams have started welding already installed shields. The shields will protect all exposed piping, manifolds, control panels, and other components from engine exhaust and debris. Doors are installed on some shields so that, if necessary, the pipe work and control panels can be accessed. Water deluge system installation work is also ongoing at the launch site. More and more deluge system hardware arrived at Starbase for installation. Setting up the deluge system and establishing a sufficiently massive water supply will take several weeks. With the launch attempt quickly approaching, it looks like the deluge system may not be ready in time for the orbital test flight. Let's hope that the launch pad will withstand the extreme acoustic and thermal environment that will be created by all 33 engines of Super Heavy Booster 7 during liftoff, even without a deluge system. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk recently revealed details about the next phase of Starship Raptor engine tests. Currently, Raptor engines are tested on test stands at SpaceX's McGregor rocket development and test facility before being sent to Starbase for installation on Starships and Super Heavy boosters. Hundreds of such tests have been successfully conducted at McGregor over the past several months. According to Musk, the Raptor engine start sequence is now reliable on the test stand under most conditions. Those conditions include engine ignition during liftoff, restarting a few of the 33 super heavy engines during boost back burn, atmospheric reentry burn, and landing burn just before the launch tower arms catch the booster. In the case of Starship, several engine re-ignitions are required for orbital raising and course correction during its trip to Moon, Mars and beyond. The next phase of Raptor testing involves engine ignition at increasingly difficult propellant inlet pressures and temperatures. SpaceX must ensure the Raptor engines are reliable in such circumstances, because such extreme conditions could occur at any time during a mission. Moreover, Raptor should also operate without failure even if the inlet pressure is lower than the intended pressure, and relatively warm liquid oxygen is introduced into the engine. We'll have to wait for future updates from Musk to know if Raptor has met all these conditions. SpaceX conducted a cryogenic proof test involving Starship 26 on Monday, February 27. Unlike all previous Starship cryoproof tests, a very small amount of liquid nitrogen was pumped into the ship's oxygen tank on Monday, and that too very slowly. After holding the spacecraft in that state for about 15 minutes, SpaceX ended the test for the day. Ship 26 successfully completed its first cryoproof test on February 21. The ship's methane and oxygen tanks were completely filled with liquid nitrogen that day. It's unclear why only a minimal amount of cryogenic liquid was pumped into the vehicle for the second cryoproof test. Ship 26 was removed from suborbital launch pad A on Tuesday morning and returned to the build site the same evening. Ship 26 is currently stationed beside Ship 27 inside the high bay. It looks like Ship 26's cryo-proof test campaign is over, if that's the case, the next step will be the static fire test campaign. Once all six Raptor engines are installed, Ship 26 will exit the high bay to begin static fire tests. The test will happen either at the Starbase launch site or at SpaceX's new test facility at Massey's. A Super Heavy Booster Test Tank, dubbed Booster 6, has already arrived at Massey's from Starbase for its test campaign. Starship 25 is now at Massey's, and its static fire testing will happen in the coming days. Since SpaceX owns the 1.2-kilometer road that leads up to Massey's from Highway 4, no road closure is necessary for Starship testing there. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. SpaceX launched the Crew-6 mission for NASA on March 2 from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, sending four astronauts to the International Space Station. The mission carrying NASA astronauts Stephen Bowen and Warren Hoburg, along with United Arab Emirates astronaut Sultan al Nayadi and Roscosmos cosmonaut Andriy Fedyev, was originally scheduled for liftoff on February 27. But that attempt was scrubbed two minutes before liftoff, due to an issue with the engine ignition system. Hold, hold, hold. We are standing down due to a T-tab ground issue. NASA and SpaceX later traced the problem to a clogged filter in the ground system. Due to this problematic filter, triethyl aluminium triethyl borane, or TTEB, a pyrophoric mixture that reacts with liquid oxygen to spin up the Falcon 9's nine first stage engines, was not reaching the vehicle. SpaceX had to replace the filter and reset the countdown clock for Thursday's launch. 
About two minutes and 40 seconds after liftoff on Thursday, the Falcon 9's first stage separated from the upper stage and landed on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, marking its first liftoff and landing. Meanwhile, the rocket's upper stage continued powering the Crew Dragon Endeavour into orbit. A little more than 12 minutes after launch, the capsule separated from the upper stage and began its journey to the space station. 25 hours later, on Friday morning, Dragon Endeavour arrived near the International Space Station and started docking procedures. Endeavour was positioned to dock about an hour earlier than that, but the capsule stood down while mission controllers troubleshot a faulty sensor on one of the 12 hooks that helped the capsule connect to the ISS. Eventually, ground teams beamed up a software override that fixed the sensor problem. Following Dragon's link up to the space station's Harmony module, the hatch was opened and the astronauts aboard entered the orbiting laboratory. During their six-month stay at the space station, the crew will undertake important scientific missions aimed at advancing human space exploration and improving life on Earth. Crew-6 is SpaceX's sixth operational mission for NASA's commercial crew program and the company's ninth overall crewed flight. The next SpaceX crewed mission, Axiom-2, a private crew mission to the ISS, is scheduled for May 12. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launched the first batch of the company's next-generation Starlink Internet satellites on Monday, February 27, from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The mission, dubbed Starlink Group 61, carried 21 next-generation Starlink satellites, known as V2 Mini, into orbit. Little more than an hour after liftoff, Falcon 9's upper stage deployed all 21 satellites into a 370-kilometer low-Earth orbit. Starlink's second-generation satellites include the V-2 minis and the larger V-2 satellites. The larger V-2s are designed for the SpaceX Starship rockets, and the V-2 minis are scaled-down versions that can be deployed from a Falcon 9 rocket. The Starlink V-2 mini satellites are each 4.1 meters wide and weigh roughly 800 kilograms, making them almost three times as heavy as the first-generation Starlink satellites. According to SpaceX, V-2 Mini has more powerful phased array antennas, providing four times the communications capacity of earlier generations of Starlink satellites. The V-2 Minis are also equipped with argon hull thrusters, which had never previously been used off-Earth. This highly efficient but low-thrust electric propulsion system generates thrust by accelerating argon gas through the engine using electricity. The SpaceX thrusters produce 170 millinewtons of thrust using 4.2 kilowatts of power, with a specific impulse of 2,500 seconds. V2 minis employ a combination of mirrors, a new type of dark paint, and adjustable solar arrays to reduce their reflectivity. Like the previous series of Starlink satellites, the upgraded V2 mini spacecraft features an autonomous collision avoidance system to help them avoid collisions with other objects in orbit. The Gen 2 Starlink satellites could improve coverage over lower latitude regions and help the network cope with rising user demand. SpaceX has now launched more than 4,000 Starlink satellites, and the company has regulatory permission to send up 12,000 satellites and has applied for approval to deploy nearly 30,000 more satellites. Astrospace has released its investigation findings into the launch failure which lost a pair of NASA's Tropics-1 mission satellites. The Tropics-1 mission was launched in June 2022 on Astra's Rocket 3.3 vehicle. During the flight, shortly after the ignition of the upper stage either engine, the rocket's fuel consumption rate increased and remained abnormally high for the rest of the mission. As a result, the upper stage could not achieve the necessary orbital velocity and deliver the payloads to the intended orbit. The failure investigation analysis report released on March 1 showed that the abnormal fuel consumption was caused by a combustion chamber wall burn-through due to the regenerative cooling system failure. In a regenerative cooling system, some or all of the propellant is passed through channels around the nozzle. This allows heat from the nozzle wall to be absorbed into the flowing fuel, keeping the wall at a low enough temperature to prevent failure. Astroflight data showed a partial blockage of the upper stage either engine fuel injector, decreasing the rate of fuel passing through the cooling channels. This reduced the amount of heat the fuel could absorb and made the combustion chamber wall hotter, resulting in wall failure. As a result, a portion of the RP-1 fuel flowed directly into the combustion chamber, essentially wasting it. In addition to the partial blockage of the injector, Astra determined that a secondary factor for the burn-through was thermal barrier coating erosion. The inside surface of the combustion chamber of the upper stage engine has a thermal barrier layer. During the investigation, Astra found a small amount of missing thermal barrier coating, resulting in an increase in local burn-through. Taking the lessons it learned from the failure, Astra decided not to pursue Rocket 3.3 and has moved to their next-generation launch vehicle, Rocket 4. You may read the full launch failure investigation report by following the link in the description.
Surface Water and Ocean Topography, or SWAT, is a joint NASA-French satellite launched in December 2022 to map Earth's water in amazing detail. The spacecraft was in good shape when it established communication with Mission Control after entering orbit in December. The satellite then entered a six-month commissioning period to make sure that all of its instruments were working properly before it begins its operations. According to NASA, SWAT's main science instrument, the KA Band Radar Interferometer, or Karen, was briefly powered on in mid-January, before its high-power amplifier unexpectedly shut down. Karen is designed to survey at least 90% of the Earth's surface and measure water height. NASA engineers are currently working systematically to understand the situation and restore operations. The SWAT team hopes to fix the issue soon so that the satellite can resume calibrating its instruments before it begins science operations in July. SWAT is on a three-year mission as the first satellite to conduct a global survey of Earth's surface water to measure how it changes over time. The data will help scientists better understand the effects of climate change and better predict global flood risks. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.